Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shot. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Tracy, how many times have we heard in the past few years that exercise is good for your health? A long time. Yep, and it is. <laughs> Almost forever. <laughs> it's, all, it's good for you in many ways, including lowering your risk of heart disease. What's an expert's opinion, you might ask? Well, joining us in studio is the co-director of the Sports Cardiology Clinic at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Todd Miller. He's also my hero. He's a longtime runner and has completed over 20 marathons. Well, that's 19 more than you, right? <laughs> we're, in the same, we're in the same camp, though. We're both marathoners. I know. I know. That's <laughs> Welcome a, to the program. A lot more than I've done, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Miller, good to have you on the program. Tell us about this Sports Cardiology Clinic. Well, Mayo has a long tradition of teaching people about exercise, and the way that has generally evolved is people who generally have been sedentary are encouraged to exercise, and that's part of the executive health program, but it also applies to people who might have new-onset coronary artery disease. If you've had a heart attack, you're placed in a cardiac rehab program. And that's been a supervised exercise approach that applies to people who generally have been sedentary. The sports cardiology clinic that we uh, have been performing for the past half dozen years relates to people who consider themselves athletes. So it's more than just the recreational exerciser, it's somebody who's entering competitive events. And we generally break this up into two camps. There's the pediatric sports cardiology clinic, which mainly applies to high school and collegiate age athletes. Much of what goes on there is screening people for underlying heart problems. It's become a big uh, issue. And in the older adult athlete, it applies to people who might be entering a 5K or a 10K, and they would like to continue participating, but they have some concern about their heart, or they've actually been diagnosed with heart disease, and they're wondering, can I continue these activities? So you said that you're trying to screen them for an underlying cardiac problem so that uh, they wouldn't get into trouble when they did compete. That's correct. And, most and how do you do that? Well, most of the screening goes on in the younger athletes. So if you look at it backwards, each year in the United States, there's about 80 cardiac events on the athletic field or shortly thereafter that occur in these younger athletes. And when you look at what cardiac conditions are causing those deaths, they can be identified as a few underlying abnormalities, something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's an over overdevelopment of the heart muscle. It's a heart muscle that's excessively thick, or some of these people are prone to certain arrhythmias of the heart because they have congenital conditions called long QT syndrome, or some uh, individuals have an artery that the coronary artery, instead of taking the usual path, takes an abnormal pathway that can also be associated with sudden death in young people. So you can screen for these conditions. The trouble is our screening tests are not very good for applying them to large populations, at least the cheap tests. And if sure. you want to apply the more accurate tests, it becomes a very expensive proposition. I read recently that there's evidence that extreme athletes, marathoners, uh, Ironmen, et cetera, might be increasing their risk for developing an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation and possibly even coronary artery disease. True? Uh, that's correct. There's been a lot of concern about that. So the way these studies are usually done, they identify a big po population, a community population, and they look at the prevalence of coronary artery disease or atrial fibrillation. And then within that population, they can identify a handful of extreme athletes or maybe 100 athletes out of several thousand people. And what they'll do then is take the athletes and match them to other members of the population by age and gender who are not extreme athletes and they look at the prevalence of these conditions, atrial fibrillation or coronary artery disease. And in these cross-sectional studies that are performed that way, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation has about, been about five times higher than in uh, similar sedentary people. Why? Oh, there's a lot of uh, plausible mechanisms for that. When you exercise, you develop what's called athletic heart syndrome, so your heart chambers get bigger, hmm. and the atrial fibrillation arises from the upper chambers of the heart, the atria, so they will also enlarge as part of the athletic training. And as you stretch heart muscle, it makes it more arrhythmia prone. So that's one of the more common mechanisms as to 
why this is felt to be more uh, common in the athletes. Have you ever uh, studied whether or not marathoners or those who uh, have done high intensity exercise live longer or don't live as long as the general population? Um, it's hard to tease out that data, but um, there are studies that have looked at it. And probably the best study was done in France and they looked at uh, cyclists who had been in the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. And they found that, again, compared to age match, controls and all that who are sedentary, the cyclists were living longer than the people who weren't physically active. Well, let's talk about the average people. <laughs> and you used the word athlete in the beginning, and I think it has, it seems to me that a lot of people get confused about the word athlete. Like if they want to go out and just start walking and then maybe run a little bit, a 5K or something, they don't consider themselves an athlete. So first of all, I'd love to know what a cardiologist's version, a uh, definition of what an athlete means, and then tell me how um, exercise helps your heart. Right, so in terms of the definition of an athlete, we consider someone an athlete who's entering formal organized events. And for the adult crowd, it's mainly distance running or mm -hmm. triathletes. There are some other sports, but that's most of it. In the upper uh, Midwest here, we also see some cross country skiers, et cetera. So that's how we define an athlete. Part of the reason why this has become such a prominent issue is if you look at entrance, so some of these are repeat people, but if you look at entrance into distant events of 5K or longer each year, it's 20 million in the United States right now. So as the population's aging, more and more people seem to be doing this type of thing, and then these cardiac issues arise. So for the most of us, if we want to do a good for our heart and, and we want to be heart healthy, how much exercise d do we need? What should we do? And how do you know if it's actually you're getting enough, your heart is beating enough to help itself? Right. So the emphasis these days has been on not just exercise, but physical activity. So exercise falls under the larger umbrella of physical activity. And the reason why there's such an emphasis on physical activity is we're in the middle of this obesity epidemic. 40% of the country is now medically obese. Um, and the new physical activity guidelines for Americans, the second edition of these were just released in 2018, and they put a strong emphasis on just being active at any point in time. So the old version of the guidelines said, oh, you need to do 10 minutes of some type of exercise type of activity at least at a particular time. The new version says, forget all that. Just get around and move more. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Absolutely. And, uh, but is it still true that 30 minutes of uh, vigorous exercise most days of the week is, is recommended? Yes. Yeah, so these activity guidelines emphasis, emphasize this activity that we would usually not think of as exercise, just being more active with daily life. That's called NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That's a new buzzword. But in addition to that, Dr. Shives, you also want to do half an hour, five days a week of endurance or aerobic exercise, like brisk walking, jogging. And in addition to that, you should be doing a couple of days a week of strength training to improve your overall muscle tone, which in older people in particular has been shown to help reduce the risk of falls Etc. Is, is vigorous exercise meaning you're breathing heavy? Vigorous exercise means you're breathing heavy. Um, so as you don't need a formal exercise test to check this out. You could do it that way, but you can basically do that by using the simple breath test. So when you're out exercising with somebody, you should be doing enough exercise so that you're starting to feel mildly dysmic or short mildly of short of breath. Yep. You might even break out into a little bit of a sweat, but you should still be able to carry on a conversation of full sentences. All right, no question about it. Exercise is good for you, and it's especially good for your heart. 30 minutes of vigorous exercise, meaning you're breathing a little bit uh, heavy. Most days, five days a week, That's that's how, it's that simple. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic Heart Specialist and the co-director of the Sports Cardiology Clinic, Dr. Todd Miller. Thanks again, Dr. Miller. Thank you.